Phragmites is short for Phragmites australis, and that's the scientific name of this plant. Tall perennial grass that's probably the most widespread flowering plant in the world. Uh, occurs on every continent except Antarctica. And uh, it's an interesting situation because Phrag has been in North America for at least 11,000 years. But uh, the invasive form of this plant really started showing up in Delaware probably about the, the 1940s. Phragmites is a model of a great weed and uh, it can just uh, spread very rapidly. And where we get concern, concerned as a Fish and Wildlife Agency is it uh, takes over where plants that have been in these marshes for centuries, that wildlife and fish have uh, you know, developed their life cycles around, they get displaced and uh, you know, very alters the, the whole ecosystem out there regarding it. The crowds out native species and becomes a monotype. And, uh, you can see from the plants behind me how dense they get. Uh, this plant gets anywhere from probably 6 to 14 feet high in Delaware. And a couple things happen when, when Phragmites gets into a marsh. Um, the, it has a, you can imagine once these stems die back each year, it's going to produce a lot of litter. The litter layer from several years of Phragmites stem accumulation. Like I say, these die back every year, fall over. and this is what I had mentioned earlier about how the small tidal rivulets and creeks actually get filled in. You know, with the, with the dense stand like that, it actually shades out these other plants. So that's, that's how it forms that monotype. But it has a lot of, you know, ecosystem implications by doing that because um, you're actually uh, making a marsh higher and drier in some cases if it's been in. Uh, so it removes that area as a fish nursery and feeding area. Uh, the whole hydrology of that marsh system has changed once Phragmites gets in there. You know, we within, you know, the wildlife agency are concerned it's not that great habitat for uh, a lot of species that have been here for centuries, like uh, the marsh and wading birds, uh, muskrats, uh, you know, generally the songbirds are generalists as opposed to specialists that like this stuff, so it, it certainly changes. Um, from a human perspective, there's implications. These stems die back each year, so if you have big enough concentrations, close enough to homes, you have a very serious wintertime fire hazard. Frag is, is a tough customer, and you know this is a management program, not an eradication program. Even you know after the 30 years I've been messing with the plant, you know you can see it, it's not all gone. And what we developed is what we call the, the herbicide and burn technique, where uh, generally we apply glyphosate-based herbicides, like, again, late summer to early fall, so you're looking like early August to early October. We go out and spray the plant with the glyphosate-based herbicides by helicopter. In ideal situations, we will come back in the following spring and burn off these old dim stems that are here. Uh, so what happens when, when you burn, you know, I mentioned burning alone is not a control method because it does not affect the underground rhizomat. But when, you know, that herbicide gets put in the rhizomat, you burn off these old stems, it does a couple things. It makes conditions that much better for non phragmites plants to get going. It removes the shading effect that all these tall stems have, plus it gets rid of that heavy litter layer that can sometimes prevent other seedlings and non phragmites plants to get going. So we took uh, you know, what we found out with our research and developed into a cost share program for private plant owners. And what we do is cost share on helicopter applications of the glyphosate herbicide. Generally landowners have, must have at least five acres of phragmites um, to participate in the program. Landowners to, on their own to get a helicopter to come in and spray, it's very cost prohibitive. But we as the state can pool all the work, uh, keep the costs manageable. Back in 2003, we started partnering with the uh, you know, USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, where we can uh, drop landowners' costs down to about 12%. We can break up this big monotype of uh, a plant that's not very good for fish and wildlife, get a little more diversity back in these marshes. When the plant diversity comes back, the wildlife diversity falls.